Hey, it's time for VoiceOver Body Shop here on, it's a Monday here, but you could be watching this at any time. And this week we have a fabulous guest, a voice you will recognize from everywhere, Neil Ross. Say hi, Neil. Hi, boys and girls. All righty. If you've got a question for him, you can throw it in the chat room in Facebook Live. You can throw it in the chat room in YouTube YouTube Live. You can throw it on Clubhouse if you happen to be listening with Danny Burnside over on Clubhouse. And we're going to have a great time talking about this fabulous biz that we're all so enthralled with. So stay tuned. You ready, George? Ready. Let's go. It's time for VoiceOver Body Shop right now. From the outer reaches, they came, bearing the knowledge of what it takes to properly record your voiceover audio. And together, from the center of the VO universe, they bring it to you now. George Whittem, the engineer to the VO stars, a Virginia Tech grad with the skills to build, set up, and maintain the professional VO studios of the biggest names in VO today. And you, Dan Leonard, the voiceover home studio master, a professional voice talent with the knowledge and experience to help you create a professional sounding home VO studio. And each week they allow you into their world, bringing you talks with the biggest names in the voiceover world today, letting you ask your questions and giving you the latest information to make the most of your voiceover business. Welcome to voiceover body shop. VoiceOver Body Shop is brought to you by VoiceOverEssentials.com, home of Harlan Hogan Signature Products, Source Elements, remote studio connections for everyone, VoiceActorWebsites.com, where your VO website isn't a pain in the butt, VOHeroes.com, become a hero to your clients with award-winning voiceover training, JMC Demos, when quality matters, and VoiceOver Extra, your daily resource for VO success. And now, live to drive from their super secret clubhouse and studio in Sherman Oaks, California. Here are the guys. Well, hi there. I'm Dan Leonard. And I'm George Whittem. And this is VoiceOver Body Shop or VO BS. BS. All righty. Well, another week has gone by, but everybody's vaccinated now. Well, sort everybody of. who chooses to be vaccinated. Th that, that's true. And uh, <laughs> so... You know, Some people we, think it's still make-believe. Yeah, well, sorry, guys. You know, t <laughs> tell that to the people in Mumbai right now. You know? Tell me about yeah. it. Yeah, we went to Universal yesterday. Because Marcy oh insisted gosh. we go somewhere with the family, you know. So pick like, Universal. So what was that? <laughs> what was that like? <sighs> you yeah, know, that's because, all I need to know. It was <laughs> it was Universal. You know, there was some fun stuff, but then we went back. You know, the lines are like two, three hours to get in the Simpsons ride. It's like exactly. well, the heck with this. I was at the pier, and we got there at like three with my daughter and her friend to, to ride rides. You know, and yeah. the line was like I don't know, 150 people deep, and the kids were like. Maybe if we come back later, it'll be shorter. I'm like, wait, what grade are you guys in again? Like, what part of math do you not understand? Yeah, yeah. but anyway, we actually got longer we, and longer. <laughs> yeah, we we actually came home, took a three hour nap, and then went back, and then the lines were shorter. So you know, hey, brilliant! It actually works there. Yeah, yeah, it actually does. <laughs> anyway, uh, enough about our insane lives here out in Southern California. Uh, we're here to talk about home voiceover studios and the voiceover business, and uh, we have a great guest tonight. Uh, you, you, you know, you may not know his name, but you, you definitely know his voice. Uh, aside from his instant recognizable uh, work in promo and trailers, uh, Neil Ross has provided voices in many American animation productions, most notably Voltron, G.I. Joe, and Transformers. He's also done voice work in numerous video games, including Mass Effect and Leisure Suit Larry. Six no and seven. No way! Really? Leisure yeah. Suit Larry? Yeah. That's Ross awesome. Is, yeah, he's also provided voice roles such as radio announcers in many movies, including Back to the Future Part Two, Babe, That'll Do Pig, Quiz Show, and Being John Malkovich, which was a great film. He also has announced live award shows like the Oscars, and he's written a retrospective on his long and iconic career. Uh, it's called Vocal Recall, A Life in Radio and Voiceover. So why don't you play his voice so we can hear what he sounds like? Oh, that guy. 
They are the guardians of justice. Elite warriors with no master. Your world will burn. 47 Ronin. Critics are calling Body of Lies a combustible spy thriller. You're blown. I know you work for the agency. Powerful and riveting. We're an easy target. Leonardo DiCaprio burns up the screen. Winona Ryder. Anne Bancroft. Ellen Burstyn. Kate Nelligan. Alfre Woodard. How to make an American quilt. This is the tale of an ordinary man who had everything until a man of power stole his freedom and banished him for life. Now, Sweeney will have his revenge. You can bolt the door, lock the windows, and kill the lights. But it won't make you safe. Every action has an equal and opposite reaction. Put the hands on! In Chain Reaction. Whoa. <laughs> Let's welcome to VoiceOver Body Shop, Neil Ross. Neil, welcome to the show. Oh, thank you so much, Dan. It's a pleasure to be here. I've been looking forward to this for a long time. Yeah, we've been we've been talking for a couple of months and finally we can get you on here. Uh you know, that's quite that's quite a long list of stuff. When you go through your IMDB and it's like, okay, keep going, keep going, keep, mm-hmm. okay, mm-hmm. and you keep scrolling and scrolling and, and you keep going on. Um well, Every now and then, to keep my ego in check, I look at Frank Welker's IMDb and realize it's about four <laughs> times longer than mine, and that, that puts it all back in perspective again. But thank you. Uh, you've written a book, which you know to me. Yes, it, I have. It, and now, at last, people write books, and it's called Vocal Recall: A Life in Radio and Voiceovers. So, without reading the whole thing out loud, which would I know oh, sound great because I, I actually did listen to it. I yeah. was just going to do that. That, that, that <laughs> would be a, a Andy Kaufman bit. Now, hang on. This is going to take a little while. In the beginning, no, I'm not going to do that. <laughs> Remember, he Can was you- going to read uh, Finian's Wake by James Joyce, and he starts to do it in the audience. And initially, they laugh. You know, it's a bit, oh, he's going to read a book. Yeah, it's funny. And then apparently, he really is going to read all of Finian's Wake while they sit there. The tittering subsides, and it starts to get really awkward. <laughs> anyway the king of awkward yes. yeah so you know i like i said without re- you know reading the whole book here tell us a little bit about yourself and and how you ended up where you are today uh, i was a series of uh, uh accidents or disasters you you tell me uh initially when i was like five six years old we didn't have a television so it was the radio and the record player And I just found myself compulsively imitating the accents and the voices that I heard coming out of these little devices. It wasn't with any thought of having a brilliant career. It was just fun. You know, some kids build model airplanes and I sat in my room and did weird voices. And my father was convinced he had a mental case on his hands. (laughs) But um, then as I got into my teen years, I discovered rock and roll music, which led me to the radio, which was just about the only source at that point. And, uh, then I gradually began to pay less attention to the music and more attention to what was happening in between the tunes, the DJs, what they were doing, what they were saying, how they wove commercials and weather forecasts, et cetera, et cetera, and put together a show. And suddenly uh, one mad night when I was about 15 years old, listening to Bill Balance on KFWB, I thought maybe I could do that. And this little tiny spark became a roaring fire, and I became utterly obsessed with radio. And uh, that became my goal, and I got into the business just after my 18th birthday. And I stayed in far too long. I was in for 21 years. But somewhere along the way, I discovered this wonderful business called VoiceOver existed. And once I found out about that, my goal became to get out of radio and get into voiceovers because I felt at that point I was only using about 40% of what I had to offer in radio. Whereas voiceovers, if I could find any job that would be close to 100%, it would have to be, it would have to be VO. I, I, I struggle for a metaphor, but, well, that's nice. One of the, uh, <laughs> that's my metaphor. It's, <laughs> Uh, one of the ones I use, I say, well, radio is like driving a cab and uh, voiceover is like driving in the Indy 500. They both involve driving, but uh, it's a whole different level. Or it's vo- uh, radio is like working at McDonald's. Voiceover is like working at a five-star Michelin French bistro. It's, it's, there's just no comparison. So I was 
I was able to make the transition between the years 78 and 83. And I did my last radio work in 85, never looked back. Mm. And, and, and you look back and go, thank God he left that. Yeah. Yeah. How, oh, many, how many salesmen did you kill? You know, and- If I'd stuck with it, I could be getting kicked out of a trailer park today. I mean, <laughs> this is what I missed out on by foolishly getting into voiceover. <laughs> yeah, it's yeah, it's one of those things. Well, let me, you know, I'm going to jump ahead on this question, but before and before I get to that, I want to remind people that you can ask questions on Facebook Live if you're watching this live. If you're uh, watching it live on YouTube Live, you can ask there as well. Somebody is monitoring our chat room, and on Clubhouse, and uh, you'll be able able to actually ask Neil your question live on the air, or if you're listening to this on Thursday, back what he said on Monday. Um, but you know, there are so many people who start in radio who aren't able to cut it in commercial voiceover. You know, why is that? Why do you think? Well, you know, there's superficial resemblances between the two businesses, but they are very, very different. Um, and I think you have to really have a genuine love for and desire to be a part of voiceovers to make the transition from radio. I, I, frequently we'll get a call from a, a disc jockey who just got fired and hey man can you get me into voiceovers and i always say to them look if uh, if you really have a genuine desire and passion to do this i might be able to help you but if you're just looking to make a couple extra bucks on the side until you get another radio job don't bother it's not you're not going to get anywhere uh the problem is that radio gives you, you, you develop bad habits. You develop what uh, the late Dawes Butler called the cosmetic read. It's a, it's a radio announcer. You hear them doing live copy on radio stations, and they're reading it kind of like this, and it's all very smooth and professional, and they don't make a single mistake, but it has absolutely no believability. The subtext is, I'm just reading this. I have no idea what it is. I'm thinking about what I'm going to have for lunch this afternoon. Member FDIC. And and you think, well, that's pretty slick. And everybody at the radio station loves it. Boy, you sure sound professional. Maybe you should do voiceovers. Well, maybe I should. And you toddle down some to some agent, the first agent I talk to, who listens to your demo, looks at you and says in the tone of voice they might use to say child molester, you sound like a goddamn radio announcer. What's the problem with that? And, and he tried to explain it, and I went to workshops. I'm still trying to solve the conundrum. You, you're not an announcer. You are, if all goes well, a trusted voice who is imparting really important information to the benefit of the listener and you are you if you really are good somehow the microphone and the console and every, and the radio or whatever they're hearing it on the television it all washes away and it's just one person communicating with another person but it's incredibly difficult the i, I worked with a guy named brian cummings that was the first workshop i was in lovely guy and you know he was trying to teach us how to how to make these things come to life and he'd say picture yourself talking over the back fence to a neighbor what's the fence made out of what does his yard look like uh you know but i was willing to try anything at that point what what really hit me was when i took an acting class in hollywood which i was horrible at but this one guy got up and tried to do a monologue and the teacher stopped him and he said wait 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 so let me ask you a question have you read the entire play that this monologue comes from? And the guy said, well, no. And he said, well, that's why you, the, the monologue isn't working because you don't know the situation. You don't know the story. And, I, and something clicked in my head and I said, yeah, that's the thing with a 60 second radio commercial. It's a monologue, but you don't know the story. There is no story really. And then I realized, well, then you have to make one up. And I used to do that. I'd look at a piece of copy, and then I'd try to imagine what, what set of circumstances might have led all the way up to the moment where I first begin to speak. And almost those first few words should almost sound like, I've already been talking. You just missed that part. Here's the part you get to hear. I don't know if that makes any sense. No, totally. 
Yeah. You know, and that's what we tell people. I mean, that's what we try to, we try to explain to people, look, it's a one-on-one -on -one conversation. You're not talking to a crowd. Um, you know, I mean, you, you know, unless of course you're, you know, announcing at a football game or something like that, but most of the time voiceover is a one-to-one -one conversation. It's intimate and, and, and yeah. people need to yeah. learn that. So, uh, once again, we're talking with, uh, with Neil Ross, author of the book, Vocal Recall, A Life in Radio and Voiceovers. Again, if you got a question, throw it in the chat room so we can get to that question a little bit. Uh, George and I had a great guest a couple weeks ago, uh, Kevin Gershan. And, and, and as he was talking, he said something along, line, along the lines of, well, we, we had Neil Ross available to narrate this or that, and that was all I had. I didn't have to worry about it. Uh, something along those lines. Uh, he apparently was very happy to have someone like you. What was... Uh, what kind of stuff did you do with him? Oh, bless his heart. Well, it's, uh, you know, I haven't actually done that much with, with Kevin. Once in a while, I will work for him, but we're more friends than, than uh, employer-employee. It was probably a promo. The, uh, the thing is, and uh, I, rem I remember my agent, T.J. Escott, of uh, what was then CED, what is now CESD, and he's no longer, he's retired, but he was sort of musing, and he said, I regard you as uh, my utility player. And I knew just what he meant, uh, you know, a baseball term. It's a player you can stick in any position, and he'll do a good job. He might not be the best first baseman in the league, but you throw him into first base, he'll do a damn good job. Put him on second, short, outfield, whatever. <clears throat> That's kind of the way I am. I'm a uh, I'm a utility player. You can throw damn nearly anything at me, and I'll 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 manage to come up with something. There's there's almost no phase of voiceovers that I haven't worked in. Uh, up until recently, I hadn't done a game show, but now I'm doing a game show. So I can't. I literally can't think of anything else in voiceovers I haven't done. You know. Yeah. I, it's, it, again, looking at your IMDb, it's like, well, you were and did a lot of stuff, but you you've also played an announcer in some movies. Yeah. Then you, then you have to try. What were those bad habits I've tried to get rid of? <laughs> I've got to get them back. You know. How about medical narration? Have you done a bunch of that yet? <laughs> uh, I used to, I used to do those, uh, but did uh, you really? Not lately, yeah, yeah. In the beginning, I, my, one of my first successes when I got into voiceovers was actually uh, narrations, and I figured out why that was. And and in this case, radio helped. You know, you work for these uh, stations where there's not much of a budget, and so you don't have a newscaster. You're the newscaster. So what happens is you roll the last record before the top of the hour, and you run down the hall and you rip a five-minute newscast <laughs> off the wire. Don't don't ask what the wire is, boys and girls. And you run back <laughs> in the studio and you scan it real quick, looking for typos, and you tear it into well, a. Well, you look for typos. Wow. Well, sometimes <laughs> it's uh, you know, the president said today, knee slap, <laughs> ampersand. <laughs> you know, and now you got, you got to ad lib something the president said, so you don't want to get in that trap. But anyway. The record is now tailing out, and it's news, news, news time. Boom, boom, bang, bang, and on I come. And I, the, I haven't had a chance to read this. As I said, I just checked it for typos. So the news is as big a shock to me as it is to the audience. But it can't sound like that. So I developed over time this very authoritative newscaster read, which uh, the subtext of which was, I have researched this and prepared it and written <laughs> it. I am thoroughly familiar with its contents, and now I am going to impart it to you, the listener. And somehow that worked for uh, non-broadcast industrials, especially stuff where uh, they were trying to uh, get salesmen hyped up to go out on the road and sell something. And I, I think that's where the medical stuff, some of that was medical. And uh, so I had some luck there early on in my career, which made up for my, my hideous lack of uh, success in commercials for a while. <laughs> yeah. 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 The, 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 the whole thing about what we used to call rip and read, you know, and you yeah. run back there and you find the teletype and, you know, the teletype was this, a typewriter that was typing by itself. It had a keyboard, but no one, you know, but it was typing out wonder, the who, news. Who, who is typing and where the hell are they? You That's know? right. <laughs> You know, like you yeah. get four headlines and like pray that as you're reading it, you're not reading about some disaster in some very pleasant voice. Um, anyway, again, we're talking with, uh, with Neil Ross. Uh, now you've worked in all the big studios here in LA. Uh, 
tell us what studio work was like in the, you know, in the eighties and nineties. Well, it was, it was delightful because in the radio business, I don't know how it is now, now that it's all digital, I'm sure it's a whole different world, but in those days it was record turntables and cartridge machines and uh, this sort of thing. And most of these stations were hideously maintained. The equipment was old. It was, it didn't work. I, I'll never forget. I was, I was at KMPC, which is on the, uh, the mic, mic flag here. That actually was in the studio at one time. And this was a big deal. 50,000 watt Los Angeles radio station, Golden West Broadcasters, et cetera, et cetera. And I was asked to record a commercial. And we had this old Scully tape deck. And I'm trying to record this commercial, and I play it back, and it's full of dropouts. The thing just drops in and out of record. So I went across the hallway where there were three, I swear, three engineers sitting in an office. They all had their feet up on desks, and they were reading equipment catalogs. And I said, uh, the Scully, it, uh, yeah, we know. Well, is there anything you can do about it? Well, no, we've tried three times, and we can't fix it. They should buy a new one. I said, well, when are they going to do that? I have to this goes on the air in half an hour. Well, we can't help you, bud. And they went back to reading their equipment catalogs. And then I spotted the vice president and general manager in the hallway. And I said, can I just have a moment of your time, sir? And, and I took him in and I explained the situation. He said, I see your problem. I see your problem. But I'm afraid there's nothing I can do about it. And he turned on his heel and walked away. Meanwhile, just up uh, Cahuenga, uh, in the past there uh, was L.A. Studios with all this brand spanking new lovely equipment and everything worked and the people operating it knew what the hell they were doing. And I mean, I, I couldn't believe it. I thought I died and gone to heaven. And, and really every studio I went to, they were all uh, just beautifully equipped and, and the engineers knew what they were doing. And I, I, I just thought, oh, man. I've arrived. I got to do that. I can't go back into radio. It's, uh, uh, you know, the, the contrast was just so amazing, so stark. And um, the engineers, uh, oh, God, I can't say enough good things about the engineers. They're, they're just the best. And so I, there's a little thing that I put in my book. It, it's a sort of a composite of the kind of thing that happens. And uh, you, you get into a situation where you're, you're, doing a, a radio or television spot and the takes start to mount up into the forties and the fifties and the sixties. And what has happened is you've got a relatively inexperienced director or directors and it's a day, it's a glamorous thing. They got out of the office. They're going to have lunch somewhere nice. And they're in this interesting studio and they get giddy and they don't realize they got it on take seven. And they just keep chasing this mythical perfect take and putting on layers and layers of instruction try to do that be happy be sad be fat be thin and try to have fun with it and you know you, you, i mean look you know i know there are people out there that have real jobs digging ditches and doing horrible stuff and the idea of some guy moaning about having to talk into a microphone for 45 minutes is, doesn't elicit a lot of sympathy but it's tough to keep it fresh after about 50 takes, it turns into gibberish. Anyway, what happens is <clears throat> the engineer, if he knows me and trusts me, he sneaks the talk back on so I can hear him. And he turns to the director and he says, look, I have a session coming in at the top of the hour and it can't be moved. If you want to get out of here with anything usable, you need to start listening to some takes. I recommend five, seven, and nine. And I sit there and look at my shoes, pretending I didn't hear it. And the guy goes... Uh, all right, just uh, hang tight for a second, Neil. We're going to check something in here. And uh, five, ten minutes goes by, and then, hey, guess what? You're done. Come on out. Sign the form. You know, and I go, you know, we had it on take seven. Isn't that a hoot? Yeah, that's, that's <laughs> a hoot, partner. <laughs> it's been a thrill working with you. May God forgive me for lying. <laughs> and, uh, you know, th th that. My, if, if an engineer ever says anything to me, and they don't very often, I mean, it's not really their job to, but if somebody says something, boy, I pay attention to it because those guys and the lady, there weren't many women in it now. I'm sure there are m many women now, and that's good. But, uh, you know, they, they, they've seen it all. They've heard it all. And uh, everybody should listen to what the engineer says. Yeah. That, you, ever, you ever have a client in there? 
that you've had to deal with? Oh yeah, sure, sure, sure. That, that, you know, yeah. <laughs> Anytime the client shows up, you know, you're not going to have any fun because <laughs> <laughs> you can't do shtick. They get, they get worried. It's like, why, why are you people laughing? This is serious. <laughs> this is my livelihood. <laughs> Concentrate. <laughs> okay. Sorry, sir. <laughs> Once again, we're talking with Neil Ross. Again, if you got a question for him, throw it in the chat room. Uh, they're starting to pile up in there. So if you want your question answered, put it in there now, and uh, we will get to that in the next segment. So you, you were you worked in you know in in the studios in the you know in the eighties and nineties, and you know you accumulated all this stuff. And then, how long did it take to really shift? into what we're seeing today. And, and trust me, we've seen it change a whole lot since it's gone online and stuff. And how did it change for you? If you will indulge me, Please. I'm not going to read a whole lot, but I want to read something from this book that I don't know if it's, it's called How to Break into Motion Pictures, Television Commercials and Modeling. It's, it was written by a woman named Nina Blanchard. And uh, she's passed away and the book is out of print. But... Uh, I read that. Thank God I didn't read this before I got started in the business. It might have just <laughs> completely destroyed me. But here, she doesn't write a whole chapter on voiceover. She just writes a few paragraphs. But boy, what paragraphs they are! Quote: The voiceover field. Now, this was this book was published in 1978. So this is the business in 1978. The voiceover field in commercials is probably the most lucrative has the fewest number of actors and is the most difficult to establish yourself in. Voiceover, where the artist is heard but not seen, is used in commercials, animated cartoons, movie trailers, promos, radio, and other television work. We know that. There are about 100 good voiceover actors working in Los Angeles, 100 in New York, and 20 in Chicago. The ratio of jobs for women in this field is about one job in every 10. Actors who are considered superstars in the voiceover field may make from two to three hundred thousand dollars a year remember this was 78 and then she says voiceover actors are a rather elite group somewhat isolated in the commercial field they often work alone in a studio they seldom come in contact with the other actors working on a commercial their faces are mostly unknown to the public except for the occasional film stars there are no very young actors among them they are all over 30 and i think as a group are probably the most professional actors in the industry. Wow. And, hmm. you know, I would, I would quibble on her figures. I think there were more <laughs> than 100 in Los Angeles at that time, but maybe two, 300, I don't know. And they were all mostly men, and they were older men. The median age uh, uh, in those days, I would have pegged at maybe 55 or 60. I mean, I didn't get rolling till I was almost 40 and I would show up for these auditions and these guys would call me kid and sonny and boy because they were all 20, 25 years older than me. They had the voices had gotten down in here because of <laughs> a lot of this and a lot of this. <laughs> and, uh, you know, and, and, and we were considered elite. You know, I stumbled across this book after I'd gotten into the business and I, I just felt the surge of pride, like, wow, I'm part of this. But if I'd read that in 78, I probably would have given up. But, uh, <laughs> you know, uh, sometimes we would audition at places where they mostly did on camera casting for commercials, but they would pick up a voiceover job and they put a little tape deck on the desk and hang a mic off a fishing pole and you'd read and more than once I've had people say to me, boy, we love to work with you voiceover people. You're so professional, not like those slobs out there. You know, I gave you some direction and you actually did it. I thought that was the definition of the job. Not, well, those clowns, we just have to bring a lot of film and they stumble into a performance, you know. We really oh, were elite and respected. All right, fade in, fade out. Uh, I think Bob Lloyd, uh, who started The Voice Caster, told me there were maybe 600 people working in L.A. This was around 1982-83. Uh, when I wrote the book, I got a hold of Kathy Kalmanson of Kalmanson and Kalmanson, and she told me she has an A-list, the top people on her computer. And I said, may I ask how many are on that list? And she said, yes, it's about 30,000. And that, <laughs> that was two years ago. It's uh, whoa changed a little bit. 
And then, of course, there was that horrible sea change around the turn of the century where they suddenly decided they had no interest in anybody but young people. And they figured the only way, the only people who can communicate with young people are other young people. So they fired all the old directors and producers and they brought in all these kids who had served no apprenticeship. And uh, then they st started saying, we don't want to audition anyone who's ever done voiceovers. We want real people, real people. And they got real people, real bad people. <laughs> I, yeah. I started hearing stuff on the air that would have got you kicked out of a beginner's workshop back in the day. I mean, I would, I would see a television commercial and the visuals would be stunning. The music would be soaring and the voiceover guy just kind of wasn't up to the task. And, and I would think, my God, they've run the scratch track by mistake. And then, no, that can't happen. That's, that they, somebody approved this track. And that went on for a while. For a while, they didn't want to hire anybody who had ever been in anim they want animation before. Suddenly, it was like they were, it was a, 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 an industry-wide pledge to hire anybody except somebody who works in this business. And it was a very, very crazy time. And a lot of people took early retirement and careers were truncated. And we, we've gradually come back to our senses over time. But it's, uh, it's been a long and, and rocky ride since 2000, I'll tell you. Yeah, well, we, we've watched it. And the last year has been even more fascinating well, since, yeah. since everybody had to be at home. But uh, yeah. once again, we're talking with Neil Ross. You got a question, throw it in the chat room right now. Or if you're on Clubhouse, Clubhouse still working, George? Unmute your mic. Clubhouse. Maybe I should turn off my mic. Yeah. There you go. That, that helps. Clubhouse is definitely working. Okay, Absolutely. good. Yeah. So if you've got a question there, throw it in there. Uh, and uh, the, this is very entertaining. Now, having come out of radio, of course, I can relate to everything you're saying. And I know there's a lot of people who, who listen to our show that also came out of radio, but perhaps not in the golden age when you and I were there in the 80s and stuff, and uh, or even in, this, in the 70s when I started. And uh, everything you say is absolutely true. <laughs> that's, so in case you're thinking this was his unique experience, no, that's what radio was like. Um. So, you know, things have changed, um, but now I take it, as you're saying, that you're, you're still working. You're not retired, are you? I'm sort of semi-retired at this point. I, I'm lucky enough to have the pensions, but I continue to work. And, Excellent. Uh, what is not... your definition of semi-retired? <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm serious, because to me, to me that, because I was just talking to a financial planner for the first time in my life, and she was asking me, hey, when do you want to retire? And I was like, what does that mean <laughs> exactly? Yeah. So what does it mean to you to be, as you would call it, semi-retired? Yeah. Well, j just the fact that I, that I have the pensions. But no, I, Michael Caine said something in an interview once that I absolutely think is 100% true. He said, uh, you don't leave show business. Show business leaves you. <laughs> he said, occasionally you'll see an old actor and you'll say, oh, I don't do that anymore. These movies they're making today, they're horrible. They're obscene. They're filthy. I wouldn't be a part of that. He says, you know damn well if the phone rang, they'd be there in half an hour. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm sort of waiting for show business to leave me. And it, 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 it just doesn't quite ever get around to doing it, you know, <laughs> Sometimes I think, well, maybe this is it. And then the phone rings and I'm back in the game. <laughs> yes. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> All right. Well, we're going to take a break right now and we'll get to your questions in just a minute. So stay tuned. Again, you got to throw them in the chat room or on Clubhouse. And we'll be right back here on VoiceOver Body Shop with Neil Ross right after these. Well, hello there. I bet you weren't expecting to hear some big voiced announcer guy on your new orientation training for Snapchat, were you? Stick around. You don't want to miss this. What you do. Power 103.9. At Target, we want you to come as you are. Be comfortable. Uh, okay, maybe not bathrobe comfortable. Pants for the customer in aisle four, please. Nuevo México necesita un cambio. La representante Michelle Lujan Grisham ha luchado por nuestro estado en la Cámara de Representantes. Watch anywhere, anytime on an unlimited number of devices. Sign in with your Netflix account to watch instantly at Netflix.com. The ice cream maker is a big risk that can have huge rewards until you forget to turn it on. Well, that's it, guys. Time is up. 
Hey, it's JMC. Thanks for watching the voiceover body shop. If you're demo ready or looking to get there, check out jmcdemos.com and see a sample of our work. Now let's get back to Dan and George and this week's tech wisdom. Hey there, it's David H. Lawrence, the 17th with VO Heroes. And you may be watching voiceover body shop, V-O-B-S, because you're interested in becoming a voice talent. And you looked around the internet, you found that this was a great place to come and you're absolutely right. Um, but you don't have any of the knowledge yet as to how to get started. And I'd like to help you with that. I've got a free course online. You can take it anytime you want. It's called Getting Started in VoiceOver. And it walks you through the equipment you need, the business side of things, the actual categories of voiceover work that you'll likely be pursuing, and also the mindset that you need to have when you're getting started and moving into being successful at doing voiceover for a career. So if you're an actor or you're not an actor, you want to side grade from another business, you want to learn about voiceover, go to voheroes.com slash start. That's voheroes.com slash start for the VO Heroes Getting Started in VoiceOver class. And I'll see you there. VoiceOverEssentials.com would like you to know that there's a lot of so-called experts out there saying go to bedding and bath stores and buy a mattress topper and use the foam for your DIY studio or portable setup. And counterfeit offshore acoustic foam is flooding the web. Studio foam, although expensive, is all about shaping your sound so your recordings sound the same as a professional audio studio. The sound our clients expect to hear. And will the memory foam have the memory of how you sound? Look, bed foam is great for keeping an old mattress alive and preventing bed sores, but it doesn't cut it for acoustical treatment. The PortaBooth Plus and Pro use only Oralex Studio Foam. They have a limited inventory of both while shipping logistics of the new inventory is delayed. With the country starting to travel again, the booths are selling fast. So go on over to voiceoveressentials.com and get yours now while the getting's good. That's voiceoveressentials.com for the PortaBooth Pro and Plus. This is the Latin lover narrator from Jane the Virgin, Anthony Mendez, and you're enjoying Dan and George on The Voice of Our Body Shop. And yes, we are back with Neil Ross. It was, everybody's moving around here. It's like an odd Brady Bunch thing we're doing here. Uh, anyway, uh, we've got lots of questions from lots of cool people out there who are watching the show, and uh, we'll start off with uh, George. You pronounce his name right, so go for it. I'm going to have to try to get it right this time. Hopefully, it's Rob Ryder. <laughs> it is. Um, <laughs> uh, he's on YouTube. He's watching, and he says, I, I see a call station flag on that SM5. Everybody's enjoying identifying your mic. Um, yeah. I'm guessing that's a day gig, and I think you've already answered that now, but uh, <laughs> what do you use for VO? Uh, Sennheiser 416 is my, my primary uh, microphone. Uh, this is just, uh, I was telling the guys before we went live, uh, This at one time this was the radio studio microphone, and the first time I encountered one of these was when I made the jump from San Diego to San Francisco, and I went to work for KYA, and they had one of these, and I, I thought, I've arrived, I'm in the big time, <laughs> just based on this microphone. The microphone flag is from the old uh, 710 KMPC, the Station of the Stars in Hollywood. It's no longer that. It's uh, I think it's KSPN, the ESPN uh, uh, affiliate. Yeah. I was wondering why is it why was it called the Station of the Stars? That's an interesting story. I didn't even know that and, until I think after I'd, I left there in '85. So that was my last radio work. But I read up on it somewhere. I've forgotten. There was a time. Uh, I don't know if you guys uh, listen to the old time radio shows on uh, on the Sirius XM. You hear a lot of movie stars doing radio drama, and they did that back then. The studios did not see radio as a threat the way they saw television as a threat. And so they had no problem with their stars doing radio shows. In fact, it promoted the stars and, and the movies. And so there, were a, there was a ton of stuff produced with, with major motion picture stars as radio actors. They would surround them with ra regular radio actors in the smaller roles. And a lot of those shows were recorded at KMPC in the late 30s and then all the way through the 40s. And that's why they called it the Station of the Stars, because they actually had movie stars coming in and out of there to do radio dramas. And they just kept the slogan. Eventually, the stars became the recording artists that they were playing. And 
to an extent the DJs. KMPC was home to a lot of DJs who did television work. Uh, Wink Martindale was there. Gary Owens was there. Uh, Jeff Edwards, you know, uh, Wink Martindale, of course, has done a, a million uh, game shows. And, uh, and they would, uh, you know, it's funny, a lot of radio stations didn't want you to be on television. Well, you don't need to do that. You need to be here. But uh, Gene Autry was a show business guy. And he said, you know, the more these guys get popular in any f area, the better it is for everybody, us included. So they facilitated these guys doing television work. They were told, if you need some time off to do television, just let us know. And we'll, we'll. they had actually two what they called full-time, part-time guys who had a show on the weekend, but then were available to jump in and fill in for uh, folks during the week if they had television commitments. Yeah. That's a long-winded answer, but that's why well, it's the of the yeah. star. Well, I mean, if, if you watch some old cartoons, something like Roger Ramjet, it was all the L.A. Uh, sound guy. All the radio DJs in L.A. were doing that stuff. Yeah. So, you know, it's always kind of like, no wonder those voices were so good. And, you know, the art was terrible, but the voices were fabulous. <laughs> Who do we got next there, George? Well, we have uh, Randy Thomas. Maybe a name you might know on Facebook. Randy that, says, that Neil, you are the bell from somewhere. I, I just can't. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> she said, you are the best. <laughs> It's been a minute since we sat side by side announcing the Oscars. More, more than a few minutes. That was 2003. And uh, yes, as I say in my book, uh, God bless you, Randy. Thank you. She got me through it. I don't think I would have made it through without Randy and our, our, our assistant, um, Tina. They just, uh, <laughs> they had, there was a moment where I would, I would miss a cue and Tina would... She was sitting behind us with headphones clamped on, you know, listening to the truck, and she'd whack me on the back, and I'd go, and she said, do you mind me doing that? I said, darling, if it's necessary, hit me with a brick, just so, just so I don't miss a cue. And, uh, you know, uh, that year they decided to go with a man and a woman rather than just one announcer, and so in I came, stealing half of Randy's show, and she could not have been more gracious and helpful. So uh, bl bless you, Randy. Thank you. Lovely to hear from you. Well, they're definitely always trying new stuff for the Oscars production. This year was definitely a big Definitely experiment. this year, yeah. <laughs> um, this one's from, well, actually, I don't see anybody queued up yet in the clubhouse. We've been having some technical issues with clubhouse. I'm hearing mixed reports of the audio dropping out and et cetera, et cetera. So again, it's one of our multicasted platforms. And it's, the hard part about clubhouse is I can't monitor it. So I don't know what's being heard so sorry about that if anybody does have a question in clubhouse please uh raise your hand if you can understand what we are saying um back to the normal chat bob leadham uh here's somebody actually let's let her in and here she is hi shauna sound good now it got kind of fun there for a minute during the commercials oh wow well you know we like to keep it fun <laughs> no worries Thanks for joining us. How are you doing? <laughs> I'm doing all right, you know? Great, What's great. your question? Uh, my question is I love you guys, and I was just making sure that George knew about any unusual sounds we were hearing during the commercials. Oh, thank you, Shana. No worries. Thank you so much. Cool, cool. All right. That's great to hear from the chat. That's great to hear from the clubhouse. Thank you. Um, Bob Leadham says, Bob what Leadham. advice do you have for those contemplating documentary narration? What I did, you know, the one thing they can't, you know, they can always not hire you, but they, can, they can't prevent you from practicing. And uh, to me, that's, you know, the one, the one thing they can't stop. And uh, what I did was I, fortunately, my wife uh, is a subscriber to National Geographic. So I would actually read National Geographic articles into uh, some sort of recording device and then play them back and try to discern if they sounded sort of like the folks that I heard on PBS and uh, th that kind of thing. Um, you, the, um, I always say it's, 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 it's preparation, patience, and persistence, the three Ps. And uh, Robert Edvin Evans, who uh, ran Paramount and wrote this uh, wonderful uh, book called The Kid Stays in the Picture, which I highly recommend, he described luck as when opportunity meets preparation. 
Everybody seems to think if I just met the right person, if I just went to the right party, if I just got, made the right connection, ah, well, that's part of it. But if you haven't been doing your homework as you wait for this wonderful accident to happen, uh, you're liable to blow it. And so if, you, if the phone is not ringing, things are not happening, grab a National Geographic and record an article and listen back to it. And uh, you'd be surprised what can happen. I remember being a lowly disc jockey in San Diego watching Nova on public television and thinking what a wonderful show it was. And I couldn't have dreamed at that point that I would end up uh, narrating upwards of 25 of them. Wow. Uh, you know, but it, ha it happened. And uh, yeah, it we ha had Will Lyman on a few yeah, we had Will Lyman on a few weeks ago, who you know, also did a lot of uh, Nova, and, and the, the voiceover stuff on PBS is always fabulous. Mm -hmm. What do you think is really the, the, the real key to doing documentary narration well? Aside from, I mean, obviously practicing, but when you're, you're sitting there doing it, what, what is it that goes through your mind, or what is it that you're, you're trying to practice? Well, it's, it's, it's a different animal. They're all different animals, these, these various phases of voiceovers. But I remember uh, I, w I did a, something in Nova or something like that, and I alerted my parents, <clears throat> and they watched, and my mother uh, called, and she said, you know, that was a fascinating one, and the, the story and the, the thing that had, she said, I got, frankly, I got so caught up in it, I forgot it was you. I hope you don't mind. And I said, no, I consider that a compliment. The, the yeah. narrator should impart information, but he shouldn't hammer it to the point where it, it becomes distracting. Um, you know, I remember a particular show, and I won't say which, but they had a narrator who, who had a very distinctive style. And my wife started to watch the show, and at a certain point, she said, I can't watch it anymore. His voice is just so distracting. I, I, I'm just not enjoying this anymore. And she stopped watching it. So you you need to sound as though you know what the hell you're talking about. That all comes back to the rip and read thing. And then you, you need to kind of blend with the show as best you can. And sometimes it's tough because sometimes they bring you in and I, I don't know if the show is even cut together and you, you reach a certain point in the script and you say, what's the music going to be like here? Oh, we haven't picked it yet. And, and so a lot of times you're thrown at the invisible dartboard trying to hope that you hit the right mood. I remember during this uh, awful period after 2000 where they started looking for real people, I heard a narration, young guy, and it was a story of a horrible story of a plane crash in Russia, and the plane was for some reason or other filled with children, and they were all killed. Uh, you know, a horrible story. And they cut to this misty graveyard with these gravestones. And the line the guy has, this is the something or other cemetery where the victims of Flight 4 or something or other are buried. And he said, this is the other cemetery where the victims of the thing are buried. And I thought, how the hell did they allow him to do that? Who directed this thing? <laughs> He's got a smile as he's talking about dead children. And I, I thought, I got to, <sighs> words fail me. <laughs> you know? So you, you, you've got to sort of fit the mood of the story. Some of them are lighthearted. Some of them are very, very heavy. Um, one of the things I'm proudest of, I think you can find it on YouTube. It's called Sugihara, A Conspiracy of Kindness. It's about a Japanese diplomat in Lithuania who managed to save uh, several thousand Jews from the Holocaust. Now, how the hell does a Japanese guy end up in Lithuania saving Jewish people? But it's just an amazing story. And I would get so caught up in it that I would start to cry. And then have to, I'm sorry, we got to do that again. You know, I'm sobbing here. And I get choked up uh, uh, even today thinking about it. So maybe the... There's a little bit of acting in, in narration, a very subtle kind of acting, and not everybody can do it. It's, it's an interesting, interesting thing. And Mr. Lyman is wonderful. Yes. And he's, uh, I'm very mm. jealous. <laughs> Great voice. <laughs> yeah. What do we got next, George? Uh, John Morse in the YouTube says, is there a favorite area in voiceover that you enjoy the most? If you could just do this the rest of your life. Oh, I don't think I'd want to do any one thing the rest of my life. 
you know, if if there, it's funny, you opened up with my promo trailer reel, such as it is. That's the one area of the business that I, I really didn't do that well in, I don't think, over the, over the, I did some, but I didn't do that well. But in a way, I'm kind of glad I didn't click in the promo world, because if you think about it, they, they, they're always alone, and they're essentially doing the same two or three reads over and over and over again. All they're doing is plugging in a different show name and a different actor name. And I'd much rather be in a studio with five or six other people like, uh, you know, Rob Paulson or Tress McNeil or you name it and, and, and doing, a, doing an animation project. That's much, mm. much more fun. I just like doing all of it. But, you know, if you put a gun to my head and said you have to do one thing and this, then that, that's it, it would probably be animation. But a narration coming in a close second. Awesome. You had an actual question, George. Yeah, um, because it was read off earlier in the show that you had been uh, part of a Leisure Suit Larry game <laughs> production. <laughs> I, I, I remember Leisure Suit Larry from the literally the original Leisure Suit Larry. I'm sure I was too young to be playing it when I was playing it, but I didn't. My parents didn't know any different. Yeah. Do you, what, do, what do you remember working on and how long ago was it? Because they've had some reboots, I guess. Yeah, this was a million years ago. I think this was the early 80s. No, no, it couldn't be that far back. Games didn't really start. I, the first game, out and out game I ever did was a game called Stunt Island. And I think I did that in 1990. And I had nine lines. And uh, the person directing said, that's all we have room for. The game was released on floppy disks. Yes. You know. Yeah, so it well, would have been after 1990, uh, somewhere, I don't know, 94, 95. Yeah, it has to be, af af yeah, it has to be after 87, because I'm watching. Yeah. Can, can you hear the sound effects? I don't know if you'll hear it on the air, but I'm watching a, a playthrough on YouTube of the original game. And this is when all of the action was just very low-res graphics and then types on screen what they're saying. There's no actual mm -hmm. voices, because it was too... <laughs> wow too new so yeah. you obviously weren't voicing the game in 1987 no no i was the i was the narrator and i i all i remember was it was kind of fun to do because he was so snarky the narrator right well larry you seem to have uh, screwed up again haven't you you know that sort of <laughs> that kind of stuff <laughs> that's fun to do it's doing snark is the is the best that's yeah. why we've been doing this show for 10 years um <laughs> what else we got um, grace newton yeah, do you do you still audition? Maybe that's oh, part of yeah. semi being oh, semi retired. Yeah. Do you stop <clears throat> auditioning? Well, I I try to limit uh, the driving that I do, but I do a lot of auditioning from home. Mm -hmm. Now, one of the, one of the workshops that I went to was a celebrity workshop, and uh, one of the celebrity uh, teachers was um, the late great Joni Gerber, who our younger viewers will not be familiar with but she was just uh, one of the top voiceover women of all time just seemed to be able to create a, a million different characters and, and a wonderful actress and she uh, at the start of the thing she motioned to us to come closer and said gather around voicelings and then in a voice like the story lady she used to do on the gary owen show on kmpc she said um there are no stars in voiceovers. You will always have to read for it, and they are never going to send a limo. And if you can't live with that, <laughs> then don't get in this business. Now, in those days, stars were not deigning to do voiceovers. Now, of course, they all do it. But what she meant was the rank and file voiceover people, no matter how successful you become, you are not a star. You will always have to read for it, and they ain't going to send a limo. And at the time, I thought, what is she talking about? I, I want to be in this business. I don't need a limousine. But then you, time passes, and you get a little successful, and you get a little full of yourself, and the agent calls. And well, I want you to come out and read for this at 5 o'clock on a Friday afternoon in some horrible place that you'll have to sit in traffic to get to. And you, 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 you're just about to say, go oh, tell them to go to hell. And then you hear Joni in your voice going, no stars, got to read for it, no limo. And you go, all right, all right, tell them I'll be there. Tell them I'll be there. <laughs> and uh, so, yes, yes, I, I will. <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll always be reading for it. I, there's, only, there's only one limo in voiceover I can think of, and that has to have been Don LaFontaine. La you had to buy yeah, his own. Not. 
Yeah. <laughs> and they weren't sending nope, it nope, to him. Nope. <laughs> but he bought it. You know, he paid exactly. for it. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Well, anyway, Neil, thanks so much for joining us. This has been a very entertaining hour uh, talking with you and, and reminiscing about what this business was, was like and you know what it's like today. And uh, they really are very, very different. Uh, yeah. Where can people get your book? Well, he said, cleverly whipping out his visual aid. Here, excuse me while I whip this out. Uh, the book is Vocal Recall, A Life in Radio and Voiceovers. And uh, there's a website you can go to, www.neilbook.com, N-E-I-L-B-O-O-K.com. The book is available at Amazon. There is an audio version that is available at Audible. For those which which you narrated, Audible. as I, I might add. Yes, there, there was a huge uh, citywide audition, uh, nationwide actually audition for the part of the narrator of my book. And strangely enough, I won that audition. I don't know how that happened. Amazing. Yeah. Well, Neil, thanks for being with us uh, this afternoon and this evening. And uh, I look forward to having coffee with you one of these days. It sounds like we'd have a great uh, talk. The sooner, the sooner the better, because that will mean normality of, of some kind has returned, right? Absolutely. Tell me about it. Neil Ross, everybody. All right. Well, George and I'll be right back to wrap things up and wrap it up for, uh, and get it geared up for tech talk right after this. Don't go. This is the Latin lover narrator from Jane, the Virgin, Anthony Mendez. And you're enjoying Dan and George on the voiceover body shop. In these modern times, every business needs a website. When you need a website for your voice acting business, there's only one place to go. Like the name says, voiceactorwebsites.com. Their experience in this niche webmaster market gives them the ability to quickly and easily get you from concept to live online in a much shorter time. When you contact voiceactorwebsites.com, their team of experts and designers really get to know you and what your needs are. They work with you to highlight what you do. Then they create an easily navigable website for your potential clients to get the big picture of who you are and how your voice is the one for them. Plus, voiceactorwebsites.com has other great resources like their practice script library and other resources to help your voiceover career flourish. Don't try it yourself. Go with the pros. Voiceactorwebsites.com, where your VO website shouldn't be a pain in the you-know-what. It's that time of the show where we talk about Source Elements, the creators of Source Connect, and many, many other amazing tools for collaborating remotely, which is a huge part of the voiceover business now more than ever. And uh, Source Connect is really the primary tool that you as a voice actor would interact with. You definitely want to be able to connect to the studios that are recording you and be available for those bigger budget jobs. And let's face it, the jobs that do use Source Connect tend to be those of the bigger budget gigs. Um, there's a couple of reasons for that. One is in order for Source Connect to be used, there has to be a studio involved, there has to be somebody on the other end to record you. So those are jobs that have the budget to actually hire a studio and have an engineer and all of that. And so it's one of the best kind of gigs a voiceover actor can get is those where you're being directed live, especially for commercial work, because, well, when that session's over on Source Connect, you hang up and you go on with your day to the next audition or whatever. It's a beautiful thing. You want to get started, head over to source-elements.com and get a 15-day free trial so you can get yourself familiar, get it up and running. Um, if you actually sign up for a subscription or purchase the software, you get completely free support to go through all of the hoops that may be involved to get it running. So anyway, go check it out, sign up now and tell them we sent you. All right. We'll be right back to wrap this show up. Thank you. Yeah. Hi, this is Carlos Ellis Rocky, the voice of Rocco and you're watching voiceover body show. And we are back here. Well, that was that was that's the kind of people I like talking to about what this business was really all about and how it's changed. Uh, you know, I also noticed that you know, being the technological genius that you are, that the clock right above your head is still on standard time. So, 
You know, the other person to point that out was Joe Cipriano. <laughs> <laughs> we were just, he was talking. I take it, take it for a guy who worked on radio and was in a studio to notice stuff like the time. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> well, I, I came out of radio. I knew we were right before the top of the <laughs> Exactly. Hour. That clock's got to be right. That's right. Uh, next week on this very show, uh, tune in because uh, we're going to be doing Tech Doc number 56. And uh, George and I are getting ready for uh, to reset and do that right now. So, if, And uh, we'd love your tech questions, so get ready for that. And then on May 17th, Lori Allen's going to join us? I believe so. We've I've actually reached out just to do a double check because, you know, as it is with acting, working, working actors like Lori. You never know. You never know. We'll get a confirmation hopefully soon. But uh, we miss her, and she'll be on the show one way or the other. We'll make All sure right. of it. Right. All righty. Who are our donors of the week? Well, donors of the week uh, include our friends, many of these and many of them familiar names, uh, Shelly Avellino, Tom Pinto, and Natasha Merchevka, uh, Jennifer Dixon, Brian Page, my dad, George A. Whittem, uh, Rob Ryder, Patty Gibbons, Greg Thomas, Shauna Pennington Baird, who chimed in on the chat room or actually in the clubhouse tonight to let us know how we were sounding. Thank you. Uncle Roy of Antland Productions, of course. Martha Kahn, our old friend, Don Griffith, and Stephen Chandler. All righty. Hey, join our mailing list, too. You can do that by going to our website, vobs.tv, and it says sign up for the newsletter or something like that. I have to go to the website and check those things every now and again. What does it say <laughs> is now? Is it still working? I, it's it's, still, it's still working. It is still working. <laughs> we know. I know for a fact that it's working. Yeah, it says, please donate in a red box. Yeah, and it helps. Every little bit helps, and that's how we maintain the technological perfection that you are witnessing at this very moment. Uh, we need to thank our sponsors like Harlan Hogan's VoiceOver Essentials. VoiceOver Extra. Source Elements. VOHeroes.com. VoiceActorWebsites.com. And JMC Demos. Uh, well, whoever it was in the chat room, we don't know where Jeff was tonight, but, you know, whatever. Uh, Danny Burnside, it. yeah, for, for, for toughing it out over on Clubhouse. And, of course, our amazing technical director who always gets it right, no matter what, uh, Sue Merlino, thanks She's to her. And, of course, Lee Penny for just being Lee Penny. All right, well, George and I are going to reset things and do tech talk. And uh, so stay tuned for that if you're here with us live and uh, get your questions in if you have home studio questions. So that's what makes it roll. Um, you know something? Not an easy business to, to work in. But uh, technologically, when it comes to your audio, if it sounds good, it is good. I'm Dan Leonard. And I'm George Whittem. And this is VoiceOver Body Shop. Or V-O-B-S. Yes. We'll be back with Lake Tech Talk.